So healings and miracles, as reported today, do not follow the scriptural pattern. Throughout history, there have been more miraculous healings under the auspices of non-Christian authorities, such as doctors, non-Christian authorities, correct that, such as doctors who are unbelievers, non-Christian friends and family members, and non-Christian organizations that they call miraculous, than in the Christian church itself. These miraculous healings, so-called, were for the most part not attributed to anyone with the gift of healing. Many of these healings it can be shown were psychosomatic in origin and were healed by the release of the patient's mentality which caused the illness. Many of the illnesses were temporarily in remission, but as typical with many diseases, started up again shortly after their reported miracle cure, this time worse than ever. Many of the miraculous cures were actually hysterically oriented, where enough adrenaline flowed in the body for the moment as the patient, such that he or she gave visible evidence of being cured. But shortly after the cure, they relapsed into the same ailment, only worse than ever with the new physical and emotional complications. People coming and popping in and out of wheelchairs when they, in the moment. It caused uh, minor fractures and relapses. And many of the miraculous cures were without the aid of a person designated as having the gift of healing and were legitimate and were legitimate miraculous healings. Even except to the point where it's uh, far above the norm, given the extent of knowledge of medical science at the time. That doesn't mean it was actually a miracle, but people call it that way. And it goes beyond the norm. Many, many miracles and healings have been claimed and authenticated by the Roman Catholic Church. Many of these miracles have been substantiated as truly supernatural events and healings. Some really you have. And they serve to enhance the conversion and continued devotion of millions of Roman Catholics throughout the world to their own destruction. For the Roman Catholic Church teaches the false gospel of salvation by works and the mediatory work of Mary who is made out to be a goddess to be worshipped on an equal level with Jesus Christ. Certainly the agent behind these good works and miracles, good works, miracles, and healings is not God himself leading millions of individuals astray. Since God's revelation to mankind is complete for this age, fully contained in the Bible, then the miracles which God used in the first century, for example, and the earlier prophets in the Old Testament times used to authenticate those pronouncing his his word, as yet to be published word, would no longer be necessary. So the canon of scripture is closed for this age. We don't need people coming around before it was finished to authenticate what they were going to find in the New Testament epistles, especially in the, in the Gospels, about Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the canon of scripture is closed for this age, 1 Corinthians 13.10. So no new revelation is of God until the age is past not even by a spiritual gift. So if you're saying, I have a word of the Lord for you, you say, well, excuse me, but mind if I finish the Bible first and I'll see you in the next age. Early in the church age, believers were used by God by a spiritual gift of signs and wonders to reveal to the body of Christ and to the unbelieving world information which later was written down in epistles and then organized into the 27 books of the New Testament. But these signs and wonders were only temporary. We can look at that in 1 Corinthians 13.10. We, before verse 10, we have, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, perfect, tell you, new term, not masculine like Christ has come, because when Christ comes again, there will be new supernatural events, new revelation. But with that which is perfect to come, as neuter refers to the scriptures of the New Testament epistles in Greek and, and Gospels. So when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. These are only in part the completed scriptures. Now we have 66 books. So that was done because we've had the Greek Bible from the later part of the second century, first century rather, and later on the second, it got, gives a, give us some time to distribute it throughout the world, and we have that available. So those gifts ceased. So, in the book of Hebrews, written about 68 AD, the author warns of the consequences of ignoring the message of salvation. In so doing, he states that signs, wonders, and miracles were things which happened in the past. 
and therefore were not happening during the time, the then present time of about 68 A.D. when the book of Hebrews was written. Hebrews 1, 14, 2 to 4. 1, 14, are they the angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's you and I. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, the message of salvation. At least we drift away from it. For the word spoken through angels, the law of Moses and so on, for the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense. And then how shall we escape this, this just recompense punishment in hell if we neglect so great a salvation as is provided for us by not believing? And then what follows is the key part of this passage, about miracles, which indicates the past tense, past tense, in which signs, wonders, and miracles, and certain spiritual gifts were exercised. Here it is. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it, the message of salvation was that that first spoken through the Lord. So, excuse the interruption of the phone call. So, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it, the message of salvation was that the first spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard. Notice the tense here is past tense. The message of salvation was spoken through the Lord, then confirmed by those who heard. Then in this next verse, the author continues writing in the past tense, indicating how God had authenticated the gospel of salvation, message of salvation given by our Lord and confirmed to us by those who heard in days gone by. The author states that God then authenticated the message of salvation through signs, wonders, miracles and spiritual gifts. Read this. How shall we then escape if we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it, the message of salvation was at the first spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard God also bearing witness with them by both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and the, by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So, authenticated sign wonders in the past. In the Amplified Version of Hebrews 2, four, it says, Besides this evidence, it, the message of salvation, was also established and plainly endorsed by God, who showed his approval of it by signs and wonders and various miracle manifestations of his power, and by imparting the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the believers according to his own will. God's will is saying here that in the past, before 68 AD, when the book of Hebrews was Written, signs and wonders, miracles and certain spiritual gifts were utilized, past tense, by God through men to authenticate the messengers as men of God and thereby to authenticate the truth of their message which was revealed in the past to them by God. Compare the following messages which confirm this point. Acts 14.3 So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miracles signs, miraculous signs and wonders. Notice that this passage and the following one speak of the past when referring to miraculous signs and wonders. Romans 15, 18 to 19 a, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished, past tense, through me, Paul, in leading the Gentiles to obey God, by what I have said and done, past tense, by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. At the time of Acts 14, 3, Paul and Barnabas were utilizing their spiritual gifts performing miraculous signs and wonders for the purpose of confirming the message from God according to Acts 14.3. But then later on, as indicated in Romans 15.18-19a, Paul speaks in the past tense about his performance of these signs and wonders as if to say his work with them in his, is in the past and they are no longer available to him to exercise. Therefore, the sign and wonder gifts were no longer manifested in Paul's and Barnabas' time. So doing it, saying it's, it's relevant today is not true. It is evident from Scripture that the Apostle Paul lost his gift of healing about this time when he did not heal Epaphroditus, Philippians 2, 25-31, or Trophimus, 2 Timothy 4, 20. And church history up to the present time has not seen a renewing of the authentic, authentic sign and wonder and miracle, miracle type gifts, especially specifically defined and detailed in Scripture. A detailed study of the purpose for and the godly operation of spiritual gifts, beginning with 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, will verify that whatever is going on today is in direct violation of Scripture and therefore not of God. You can compare what 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13 has to say about the miraculous spiritual gifts. Additional notes on miracles.
So, miracles. Even our Lord's brothers were not convinced by our Lord's miracles. Our Lord's miracles, however, testified to his deity that he was the Son of God who was on equal level with the Father. Ultimately, the people misunderstood Jesus' miraculous signs and attempted to force him to take over the nation of Israel and kick out the Romans. That's in Romans chapter, uh, John chapter 6. They lacked the knowledge of their own spiritual bankruptcy and a repentant faith in him instead of themselves. Ultimately, the benefit went to the disciples who would remember the many miracles that our Lord performed. They were right on with the truth, and the miracles authenticated that. But if you're not on right on with the truth, you're liable to be deceived by Satan's miracles. But the disciples would themselves go out on their respective ministries and likewise be performing miracles such as our Lord performed. The disciples would remember that most people reacted in lack of faith. In spite of Jesus' innumerable miracles, the people self-centeredly desired more miracles for their own benefit or amusement or and were not willing to trust that Jesus was the Son of God or in his propitiation for their sins. This would be the reaction of many to the gospel message the disciples would bring to the world. However, many others did believe, and the, as, as the miracles performed by our Lord served to authenticate to many who Jesus was, so the miracles the disciples would perform would also serve to authenticate these messengers of the gospel later on. Okay, the disciples would then benefit by experiencing firsthand the different responses of people to the performing of miraculous signs, even authentic ones that authenticated them as from God, so that they could wisely choose to utilize their miraculous spiritual gifts when the time came. Throwing out miracles, a lot of times, just gets a lot of bad information out there. That's why the charismatic movement is so ridiculous, because they, they aren't there to authenticate the person from God because the people in the charismatic movement don't have the gospel right. All right. I tried a while back uh, questions on miracles for Sunday school class. Now, if you want to answer these in the email, fine. Um, if you wish to comment on them, some of them are open-ended. Consider these passages and advise the purpose of the miracles. One Kings 13, 1 to 6. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says, a son named Josiah will be born by the house of David, or on you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who now make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. And that same day the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign of the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! But the man, the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. Then the, the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. Commentary help from Bible knowledge commentary. The mission of this anonymous man of God had its origins in the word of the Lord. This was a prophecy of judgment fully authorized by God. The prophet was sent from the southern kingdom of Judah to Bethel. He lived under the authority of God's Davidic ruler rather than under the influence of the apostate Jeroboam. He uttered his prophecy publicly at the altar as Jeroboam was standing near it, offering a sacrifice. This man's prophecy was one of the most remarkable in Scripture because it predicted the name and actions of a king who would not appear on the scene for 290 years. Josiah, who reigned from 640 to 609 B.C., fulfilled this prophecy just as the man of God predicted. Josiah demolished the Bethel altar built by Jeroboam and slaughtered the false priests there. A sign was often given in the prophecies of this kind when the fulfillment would take place Many years later, the man of God predicted that the sign, a miracle to verify the prophecy, would be performed then. The sign, he said, was that the altar would be splitting up, would split apart that very day. So Jeroboam's reaction to the prophecy was to order the arrest of the prophet when the king's outstretched hand, symbolizing the authority with it, this illustrated that God's authority was greater than Jeroboam's. God could paralyze Jeroboam's might and render it completely useless. The sign, the altar splitting apart, was also was also left no doubt in the minds of those present that the prophecy came from the God who controlled Jeroboam and who could judge his wickedness. 